can hear you, so that's working. That's good, yeah. And tonight, I'm actually going to remember to hit the record button for the video, so that's even better. Hey, <laughs> steps, right? Yeah, last night, I was like, 30 minutes in, my uh, laptop closed off. I'm like, wait, why would it do that for? It's recording. Yeah, I forgot to hit the button. Yo. Yeah, so nobody gets to watch my pretty face talk to, talk to Fenway. So, you know, some good news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, how's this uh, whole corona thing hit, affecting you lately? Oh, I, I'm on the uh, third week of my involuntary vacation at this point. Yeah, it's there's been a couple people on the show so far that are uh, involuntarily not working also. It's it's rough. Yeah, I'm in the restaurant business, so we got cut before they even started doing state closures. It was, it was early on we got told we were done. Damn. Yeah, so... That was a that was a quick hit. Yeah, it's. I, I had a I, I had a buddy. He uh he wasn't feeling good, so he went home, and then he tried to come back the next day, and they're like, "You can't come back to work without a doctor's doctor's excuse," and the doctors wouldn't see him because he's not sick anymore, and so he wasn't exhibiting uh any coronavirus uh, symptoms. So they're like, "Yeah, we can't see you, so you can't get a doctor's note." And like, works like, "Yeah, you're I guess you're fired." That's ridiculous. Oh yeah. That's yeah, he, that's that's a that's a hard one right there. Yeah, that's so what? So like, I know some restaurants are doing the whole uh, they're actually like doing curbside service and everything. Yeah, and a lot of delivering. restaurants are, have swapped over to that. Those that have, were in a position to even try. Yeah. Um, a lot of restaurants based on where they were or their their facilities that wasn't really even an option like you look at anything that's on the inside of a mall of course yeah. the malls are closed too but that first couple of weeks they weren't you know those those reasonable i mean there's no way for them to do curbside so yeah like but uh my uh, the restaurant i work for is doing curbside but they just didn't need anywhere near the staff they had so right. they barred down their staffing damn now, and we're all we're all technically listed as furloughed, so we still have a job, and they're paying to keep our benefits. Those of us that had benefits through them, so oh, that's yeah, good. That, that definitely least, don't have it as bad as some people. Yeah, that, that's a good thing, right there. Benefits, it's, some people are just like, okay, well, uh, sorry, we can't help you now. Yeah, like, but do you think it's going to actually like uh, since they're they've had to change their business model to to keep up with the times right now? Do you actually think it's going to actually change the restaurant business a little bit? Oh, absolutely. That's what Without I'm question. Uh, even, even if someone were to roll out a cure for coronavirus like tomorrow, which isn't going to happen, no. but even if they could, that industry is not going to change because of the mental impact of this. When you look at the amount of like seating in the average restaurant and people are kind of sardined into them these days when you go into a chain restaurant, uh, no one's going to want to sit that close to another person anymore. No. The psychological impact is going to last for years. And that means restaurants are going to have to change their floor plan, change their seating patterns. And when you do that, you reduce the overall amount of money it can generate in a given period of time. Yeah. Restaurants are going to have to take that into account. Do you, do you think they're going to be uh they're going to continue doing like the whole curbside service and like places that, that didn't deliver before are still going still going to try delivery? Yeah, uh, there, a lot of them are going to see that there's money to be made from this, and a lot of people are going to transition the way they dine into doing that. Yeah. So, uh, you're going to see a lot more curbside, but that was already happening. Um, the the sit-down restaurant has not been a really growing segment of the industry for a while, whereas the quick service restaurants, your uh, you know, great examples at your Panera Bread, your, uh, your Chipotle restaurants, places where people walk up, they get what they want, and most of them take it to go anyways. Yeah. Those are a growing segment, or, or well, they were before this rolled through. Now nothing is currently growing, but that's just the direction that like the dining mentality is going in the United States. Yeah, like, I know. It's, I know it's going to be even if it's like little minor changes. It's going to be a different world once it's over with. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, it's it's um, crazy. It'll it'll take us a couple of decades for us to get complacent, bored, and sloppy again. And, and who knows, another 100 years from now, we'll have another major viral outbreak just like we did with the Spanish flu at the beginning of the last century. Well, the, uh, it's cyclical. People make the same mistakes over and over again. Oh, yeah. Like, the they just need time to forget how to do the right thing. Oh, yeah. The latest I've heard is like uh, 
this might be going away start around like certain states in June. But then like since we all did the whole social distancing thing, the virus never really actually gets to peak, so it'll be back in the fall. And that's gonna hit us again. Yeah. Now the social distancing thing, the whole flattening the curve. Um when you flatten the curve, you also widen the curve, which is the period of time in which there is a danger. Oh, yeah. And the whole point of that has been to keep our hospitals from being overwhelmed. And on paper, that all makes sense. I understand why they're doing it. But the the social impact of this, uh, we're exasperating the social impact to limit health impact. Yep. It's, it's like it's – like if- if you don't do social distancing, you know, you know your, your economy will, will flourish, but your old people, your young people, and your sick people are probably going to die. Oh, but yeah. Uh, it, it's, and it's, it's a devil's choice. You, yeah. You've got to pick which one you want to go with. And I don't completely disagree with the decisions that we've made. It It's draconian to say many people will die so we can continue to keep a strong economy. I don't think that would have gone over well. No. Uh, Every attempt at that line of conversation since this outbreak has started has received such negative backlash. But then again, the backlash, the negative backlash from a collapsed economy is something that we won't see for, well, I say we won't see. The worst of it we won't see for months. Yeah. We're already seeing bad effects from it, but it's going to get worse. Oh, yeah. Like, like the people that are living paycheck to paycheck, they're, they're pretty much screwed right now. Oh yeah, the uh, the unemployment spike is off the charts. Oh, yeah. We've already got a higher market crash and a larger percentage of unemployment than we did in the Great Depression in the 1920s. It's ridiculous, like it's it's crazy times. Like, but like at least some politicians made some money off of it by selling their stocks off. Those bastards. So anyway, anyway, um, so let's go let's go ahead and introduce the what you're doing. You're a uh, you're actually going to general photo gap this year again. Yes, I am. It'll be my second time generally. So you're going I am to... the returning Warsaw champion. All right. So what was your? Uh, so what would you? Uh, how many? How many years have you been doing photo? Uh, let's see. This up and coming year will be my fourth year at photo. Okay. And what's your? Uh, what's your general impression of it as a player? Like as a player? Yeah. Uh, personally, I think photo is one of the one of the most enjoyable events that I've attended. And I have traveled all over the nation. Well, I say all over the nation, all over the nation east of the Mississippi. I haven't gone too far out west. Yeah. Um, but uh, I've, I've traveled all over. I've played for closing on closing on 30 years at this point. Good Full Lord. Gap is a phenomenal event. Yeah, it's It's got big hills, but nowhere near compared to the big hills, your home, your home, uh, home field. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know that one of the common things I hear from people that travel to full day is, oh, it's so hilly, and then I'm coming from Mount Doom in, in Hansville, Alabama, and Mount Doom's name comes by fairly. It, it is literally built on the side of a mountain. Yeah. Uh, I use Mount Doom as practice, and when I get to full day, it's almost like a leisure stroll. Yeah, we were there uh, last year, year before, whatever, and like we were not prepared for those hills. There is... It didn't look like it when, when you first when you first got to the field. You're like, ah, it's not gonna be that hilly. But then you, you start actually getting on the field. And you're like, oh man, this is this is this is a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mount Doom is laid out in an interesting way, where when you're coming out of the staging area, you really have no idea what the field you're walking out to is. Oh yeah. And then you find out it's actually a mountain. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's like uphill both ways. Like, ah. Like, yeah, was, was, yeah, you can pass a whole bunch of old people on their way to. They're, they're old schools when you play on that field. Yeah, like it, it was, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty intense, like walking those hills. But, but yeah, like, it's probably the, it would have to be the, the worst hike I've ever had in my life playing paintball. Like, you get half, yeah. you get half up the hill and you're already out of breath. But I mean, it was, it was, yeah, it, it'll get you. The field, the field's nice though, but like, it's just hills get you. Oh yeah. Well, Doug Arnold, the, the field owner, has, he has been in the industry since before I started playing. And it's one of the 20 oldest fields in the nation. Wow. Uh, I don't know exactly where in that list of 20 it falls, but he was uh, he was one of the ones that bought into the original uh, uh, action games, or what the original name was, through uh, Guernsey. Yeah. I think, 
I think there needs to be like a section of that field that's just like for old people that is all flat. Oh, there there is there is a there's a great section of that field that's just for the old people that's all flat. It's the uh, pavilions. Oh, <laughs> where, where they sit there and they tell stories about uh, stock class paintball back in the day. Um, like so, uh, this year, like like you said, like you said for like, this your second year coming back to, to general. Yes, and I, I can only imagine how uh, difficult. It is the general fifteen. Oh, you get half of them, so seven hundred fifty to a thousand people. Like, how difficult that is. Like, actually, like herd that many cats. There, there is a lot of kitten herding that goes into it, but I have found that the best tool for making a situation like that is delegation. You have to have the right people to delegate to, and you have to make it a point. Don't try and handle every single issue yourself. Yeah, it's it's a good point. Like, it's there's a lot of different commanders out there, and like, I know Jason Mann was on here the other day. He's gonna be on here tonight too. Yeah, I, I keep talking to him about it and everything. He Jason's goes, a, a phenomenal field leader, and I think given the opportunity, he'd be a phenomenal general. So I'd like to see him get that shot at some point. In time. He's, he's just really ugly. That's all it is. That's <laughs> true. He's got a face for radio. But he'll be on he'll be on my show video chat tonight. It's gonna be rough. <laughs> But uh, just have some Instagram filters. I hope he wears his mask the whole time. I mean, it, it, it like uh, soften the blow a little bit. It might, it might. So how's uh like I know you probably don't know the exact numbers or anything like with with the coronavirus going around right now. How's uh recruitment going for the game? Well, it's hard to get a, a fix on recruitment numbers because registration doesn't open until sometime in June. Yeah. Uh, so. What I know is that I've got my command cadre completely filled at this point, including redundants. I've got uh, unit XOs that can be changed over to generals whenever necessary. So, Or not generals, but uh, unit Man. command whenever yeah. necessary. And that's another thing that's a key point is you got to get those people locked in early. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah. Because, you, you know, the other side, they're trying to fight for them, too. Like it's. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's. Well, one thing, it was good that I was part of, I was the general from the previous year, and I had all of my connectivity with people from the year before that. So you grab people that work, and if they work, you don't change them. Oh, yeah. See, that's, you don't fix what isn't broken. See, that's what uh, Warsaw is. Warsaw is usually pretty good for that. Like, you've got the commanders that they are on this side, and like they recruit pretty well. Their units are always full, and you know they do a good job when they go out there. But that's like the downfall of the other side, NATO. Like they don't recruit well, but yet the same guys keep coming back to general to command every every year. That's that's the big fault with them. Like, yeah, that's I have I've seen that. Um, I have played on both sides of the event. So my first year, I actually played on NATO, and I noticed that there was there was a much sharper division between the command element and the actual field players yep. for NATO than there was for Warsaw when I came on the Warsaw side the following year. Oh, yeah, like, like Warsaw, the command, you can see the command unit, commanders of the units, so they're actually out playing multiple times every year. Like, you know, what you they know the field, they're, they're at command a lot, you know, they know the field, they know how to play, they know how to recruit, and, like, people know them, so whenever they go, whenever somebody that isn't even, haven't been recruited yet, they'll be like, well, who, who do I play for? Well, I don't know this guy or this guy or this guy. I know Jason Mann. I'm, I'm going to try to play for him. That was that was a key decision that I made when I took my first uh, first general lead up in the previous year. Yeah. Was I made sure that I reached out to the same Warsaw commanders that had done it the previous year because oh, yeah. I knew from that game they knew what they were doing. Oh yeah. Uh, the other thing is I kept track of who had been, you know, who had been a strong force on the opposing side, and I reached out to them because I you know I wanted them too. I ended up uh, the First year that I was, was it first or second year? It was second year that I was leading the Spets Nats because I, I came in. Honestly, I went directly from playing as a NATO player to being in the command structure in Warsaw. Yeah. Uh, I ran Spets two years before generally the last year. So I had to play against uh, Venom, who was the NATO Special Forces that year when I was re uh, running Spets Nats. And it was a constant back and forth. We were just beating on each other. And I knew at the end of that, you know, I wanted them to be on Warsaw side if I ran anything. Oh, yeah. And they were one of the teams that I made sure I got in touch with early on. 
That's, it. that's another thing. Like that's another mistake NATO made. NATO allowed you to do that. Like we have two really big teams that are active in in North Carolina, and it's paintball soldiers and Venom. And in order for the opposing force to let you have both of those both of those teams, that's that's a, that's a huge mistake right there. Like they should have been fighting for them. But yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I would even so much categorize it as a mistake as much as it is just simply, you know, I don't think they decided they didn't need them. They just didn't reach out as quickly as I did. Oh, they, they, they should, like I say, they, they probably they probably know they need them, but they should have fought a little bit for them. Like they should have tried a little harder. You know, you know, it's 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 one of those things where I'm not saying North Carolina teams are better or anything, but I'm saying like if you have a big team that shows up a lot and plays that field a lot, that's oh, yeah. probably one of the first teams you need to reach out to. Because Yeah. Home, home team advantage is undeniable. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, they play that field on a recreational level because it's right there. It's home. Yep. It's just like, you know, at my home field, if someone was coming in to lead a game, if they didn't reach out to me or the players that live there, they've made a mistake. Oh yeah. That's um, and that's anywhere in the nation. Any game you go to, the home field, the home team is gonna know corners of that field that you just can't know. Oh yeah, definitely. Like it's like I say, just in order in order to let two of the biggest team, two the I'm gonna say two the two biggest teams that play that field on on the same side. That was something that that was a, that was a definite. It's definitely a downfall for for NATO. Yeah, and then, well, also there's there's the travel factor, like yeah. The further a team has to travel, the less members of a team will make the game. Yep. There's just, you know, there's a level of attrition that you deal with when you travel. Like, I'm coming out of Birmingham, and when I came, I only had a handful of my own team, even though I was the general, make the trip. Because when it came down to it, money's a factor. Oh, yeah. Money and time. Like, because if, yeah. if, if we're up here, like, I'm an hour away from, from command. So I can I can go up there and, like, I can get off on, get off on Thursday – I can go there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and be back to work Monday. But these yeah. other these other guys, you know, they're having to take Thursday and Friday off and take Monday off for travel. And they, a lot of places they can't do that. Yeah. So that, that 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 hits a couple of my people so really yeah. hard because they're you know their union jobs or there's something along those lines where yeah. you know they got to be there Monday morning. Yeah, so that's, that's just a fact. That's that's what I'm saying. You know, letting letting these two big big home teams on the same time, so on the same field, I mean, on the same side. Is just kind of ridiculous. Yeah, but and then like the NATO command in, in a perfect world, I would think that the field itself would set aside and divide those two teams up, but they'd have to cut some sort of a team, uh, some sort of a deal to those teams to make sure they played along those lines. Oh yeah, I've seen fields do things like that. I'm not sure why command decision didn't take that approach. Uh, but I'm thankful for it since I have both sides. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, it's, and like I say, a lot of people won't, like, especially this year, a lot of people won't play NATO just because, you know, there's there's a there's a, there's a a big factor of why NATO's going to be outnumbered this year. And like I say, usually, usually I can say it can fall on the unit commanders because, you know, generals change every year just about or every couple of years, but the same unit commanders are in place every year. And yeah. they can't recruit. Like, like I say, it's guys that play – only Folda, you know, that's the only game they're going to play all year, and they're recruiting teams that don't really play anymore, or were big back in the day, or but like when they started playing, it was 10, 15 years ago, and everybody's gotten older, so you you get this old. Yeah, but, I have uh, I've seen other examples where that same sort of command fatigue, team attrition has happened. Uh, Oklahoma D Day is a great example of that. Uh, you notice it's going away. It's done. Oh, yeah. And that's because, quite frankly, it has had the same command staff and the same main teams for decades. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of people that they come together once a year to play. And that was it. That was their one game. Yeah. Um, but there was also – there was a lot of team identity that goes into it. There are people that look at themselves as being members of the unit they play on. They don't even have a team per se. Uh, a great example that was the group that I was with was the uh, the D Day the the Allied Rangers unit. Uh, they're they're a bunch of nutballs, by the way. So <laughs> if any of them happen to catch the show, I love every one of you. But I don't know a lot of y'all playing outside of that, uh, with the exception of a few guys. Uh, 
Forgotten Monkeys is one of the teams that's part of them. They're a great group, but that's a, a relatively recent team. But, uh, yeah, just across the board for D-Day, you have a lot of people who show up for that game, and that's all they played all year. Yeah. that's And the thing is, you have to – if if you want to keep playing, you have to support your community. And you, yeah. have, to, you have to go more than once a year. That's 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 the whole thing. Like it's that's that's another thing. Like I don't understand why certain people get put in a command position that don't support the community, but then you got guys out there, they're guys and girls, guys, girls, whatever you want to call, them, that are playing, you know, ten, fifteen games a year, and they're never getting their shot. Like it's it's a lot. It's a lot of it's a lot of like the uh, old school boys club. You know, there is, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and like I said, I, like, I said I'm, I'm not hating on, I'm not hating on Folda. I love Folda. Like it's a great time, but could it be better? Yes. And I think this is one of the issues that I mean, it has. Every game can be better. And listening to the player base and getting like feedback is something that every, every game producer, every field needs to do. Yeah. Um, now, Folder did just recently go through a, a big change-up. They've got uh, a change in the event producers. Yep. And this is their first run at leading it, so I'm a, I'm expecting there's going to be room for growth. Oh, yeah. There's going to be some transitionary issues. Uh, there's There are no examples out there of a change in, in execution that doesn't have transitionary issues. The question is, how well will they learn from them and adapt? And I have faith in the people that are doing it this time, so I think they're going to be able to learn a few things from this first one and come back better next year. That's awesome. That's that's, that's something that we really need. Like, just it needs to grow a little bit. Like, it doesn't need to get stale. Like, okay, you know, same people doing the same thing every year. That, that's going to drive people away. Yeah, well, and that's a lot of the mentality I feel behind bringing in unexpected generals. Yeah. Um, like, for instance, last year when I was given the general spot, most people had no idea who I was. Uh, if, I think if anybody, most people around here don't know who you are because uh, you usually go to, like, the CPX games and you're further... I, further, I do work a lot more with CPX. That's yeah, true. you're further down south and everything. Like, like North Carolina is kind of like... Uh, I, I say we're, we're kind of closed off to the rest of the uh, country. Like, we have our own little community here. And yes. until recently, we didn't know a lot of the people that, you know, quote unquote East Labs. We we didn't know who they were, and but now now they're starting to show up to Folda and some other games, North Carolina calls the CPX and everything. I said we and like we'll get like, hey, uh, can you guys come to this game? This guy's general, like you know, you want to play for him. Like, well, we don't know who that is, so why do we want to play for him? And it's just it's right. it's just the way it's been around here. Like we've been, I'm, I'm not sure what. I want to say about, but we've been like really kind of just, I say closed off to the rest of the rest of the country when it comes to this stuff. Like we, some of us have tried, some of us have tried to branch out and go to different games out, out of state and everything, but pretty much we're really, I say we're tight knit over here. Yeah. And I find that there's, there are several regions that are like that. Like the, the Midwest, when I went up for uh, living legends, a very similar story. I traveled up in there and I found that there's a lot of really strong Midwest teams that are there in that Great Lakes area that just don't know anything outside of their community. They have no idea who's over in the in the you know North Carolina region. They don't know the West Coast. I don't know the West Coast really. Yeah. That's a completely foreign environment for me. Um, Florida's another really like tight knit group. Florida has some of the like Florida has some great players down in that area that just won't travel. Oh yeah, like, and they've got. Plenty of scenario fields because they've got practically year-round weather when everyone's not quarantined. So yeah, I think you, I get, think you get a lot of experienced players coming out of that area, but they don't travel. Oh yeah, I think I think that's part of what our problem is too. Like we have just so many fields up here. Like yeah, you can you can pretty much drive an hour in any direction and hit a field. It's so we we pretty much don't have to go out of state to play. And I want to. I want you to know just how envious of that I am. I love Mount Doom, yeah. my home field, but it's an hour and a half drive from where I live, and the next closest field to me that hosts events with any regularity is four hours minimum. Wow! So every game I go to is a travel game. We we went there. I get 
Doom hosts one real scenario a year right now, and that's the uh, the Dragonfire Aliens game that's yeah. coming up in uh, October. And yeah, we we drove thirteen hours that game. Right, yep. it's it's October. It's in the mountain. It's gonna be nice and cool out there playing. No, it was hot as hell out there. Like eight, it was only like eighty degrees, but it's still hot. Well, eighty degrees in Alabama comes along with a uh, a soup like atmosphere that makes it even worse. Oh That's, yeah, <laughs> that, we don't get easy on you. That and climbing those hills too, like it, it just like we it's something I wasn't ready for. I was like October's gonna be nice and cool, you know, whatever. Yeah, I was stupid. <laughs> But yeah, it's, yeah, you you got hit with uh, summer's last gasp, as we like to call it. I mean, it's, it's that pop in October where summer just roars back and says, "No, you're wrong." It it was nice in the camping area, just like stepping outside your tent and seeing the seeing the mountains over the, over the ridge line. That, that was pretty nice. It's, it, it's got to have one of the best views I've ever been to at a game. Oh yeah, but like I say this is you're y'all were, uh, y'all were over in the low area there by the curb to the entryway, weren't you? Yeah. It was, okay. It was nice, like looking up there. The set up. Yeah, that's a great view. Oh yeah, it's like I said, it's it's a great field, but just those hills were so. Ugh. <laughs> like I I had no problem with the field myself. Like game production, I did have an issue with because those uh those refs just speeding by like every five seconds on their four wheelers and and the damn tracker all the time just kind of pissed yeah, me off a little bit. Were, there were some questions about uh, the safety from the referees, the way they were driving around. It was um, the first game I've ever been to where I threatened to kick everybody in the production's ass if somebody got hit. <laughs> like, it was it was ridiculous how, how they were being out there. But like I say, the field was great. field staff was great. It's just yeah. those refs were uh, – somebody needed to take them out in the parking lot and kick them in the ass a couple times because that, that was – you know, every time we try to push somewhere, all we hear is this horn talking and like somebody flying by fast as hell by us. Like I'm like, we had we had a kid with us. I'm like, I'm like you run that kid over, it ain't gonna it ain't gonna, it ain't gonna look pretty for everybody else. No, but no, that would that would have ended poorly. Oh yeah, but that's, but see, I, I, that wasn't on the field. That was that was definitely an outside outside productions referee and everything. So that was that wasn't the field. But that's 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 the part that got me mad. Like it kind it kind of like. It kind of put a sour turn on the trip. Yeah. Quality refereeing is something that is, how best to say this, it's hit or miss sometimes with production companies because only a handful of them have dedicated referee teams that they bring in. Yeah. Um, so sometimes they're, they're dealing with whatever they can rally up the day of, and that's not a great way to run things. No. I, you know. I can rationalize the reason why it happens, but I don't like it. Yeah, I know. Um, sometimes, even with big events, you find that just because they need more referees than they normally have, they get a lot of volunteers that join their ref team, and then at an event, it's hit or miss. Like a classic situation I dealt with was, I want to say it was 2017 at Fulda. I had somebody uh, hit me dead center, and I looked down. And it's first strike, but it's not field first strike. Yeah. And I'm like, well, this is this is off field paint. So I'm going to grab a ref and let them know they need to do something about this. Well, I grabbed a ref, explained the situation, pointed out exactly where he needed to go check, and he walked over and he started opening hoppers <laughs> for first strikes. <laughs> yeah. See, he was an airsoft ref. Yeah, see, that's, that's the first thing about how the equipment worked. That's, that's how uh, 2017 they were definitely still using – Airsoft refs, like they were, uh, I guess, like if you played, because I, I ref, I refed an airsoft game so I can get free entry to the photo one year for, for right. paintball. And, and vice versa, they yeah. did this thing for people. Yeah, and like it's a different world airsoft is because like I was standing up in the middle of, of Alpha and I was getting shot by airsoft uh, airsoft pellets, and yeah. the airsoft was like, "How are you doing that? You're getting shot and you're standing." I'm like, "Because I'm used to getting shot by paintballs. This, this isn't anything right now." And they're, they're not used to, like, the paintball refs would, like, go over and check the airsoft guys, you know. What are we supposed to really check for? You know, you, you say you shot somebody, but unless I saw yeah. it, unless I saw a pellet hit somebody, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the airsoft, yeah. airsoft refs, they seem to be more uh, timid when it comes to doing stuff. Like they don't want to get hit. Yeah, well, they, they don't want to have to 
watch the gear. Yeah, that too. Yeah, there were. I watched the airsoft player last. The why did why did the the ref ring? They were down in Alpha, and like the, the the commander was there. He's telling everybody to get down because you know they're getting ready to get attacked. And one guy just stood there, and the commander's like, he's like, get down, you're going to get shot. He's like, get down, you're going to get shot. And he's like, I don't want to get dirty. And then he got shot. And he, oh, hey, hey. Yeah, like he he actually told the commander, I don't want to get dirty. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's then don't come out here in the mud then, their guy. Like the year we did, there was a lot of guys that wouldn't even come onto the field because it rained a couple nights before. Yeah, like it, it was, it's it's a different world. Like it's a totally. Well, different I'm world. not gonna say that I'm a fan of like playing in a knee deep swamp, although I've done it several times. Dread but Legends. You're not willing to at least get a little dirty, like then outdoor sports isn't for you. No, like, it's you can get dirty playing frisbee golf. Oh yeah. Like so. these these guys were like they took they took it seriously, but until it got to the whole dirty part, like they they were out there like eating MREs on the on the field and like sitting back to back buddy style and all this kind of other stuff. And, like, but once it got to like getting dirty, they're like, no, we don't want any of that. But yeah, I, was, I, don't, I don't even know what to. <laughs> it was a strange I'm just time. Gonna let let that conversation kind of wrap itself up. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about them without being uh, unnecessarily critical. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So what what do you got coming up anytime soon? I mean, I know the coronavirus is out there and everything's like in limbo. Is there, is there anything coming up? The, the next thing that I still have on my I was looking at Ewo, but Ewo has been canceled or yeah. not canceled. It's been rescheduled for next year, uh, and that's I'll look at that next year. Now the next thing that's really on my docket, if it even still happens, is going to be Dreaded Legends in uh, in June. Yeah. And that's going to be out in your neck of the woods. That's uh, near Myrtle Beach. Oh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm, I'm planning to go on that one. Yeah. Like, like I, hope, uh, I hope it doesn't get canceled. That is a dynamic feel, Black Ops in uh, in Myrtle Beach. It's, oh, it yeah. is a very fast-paced game to play there. Oh, yeah. I would uh, I would go so far as to say I feel like it, it's a little too fast-paced. It's... Uh, with the two command posts so close to each other the way they did it the previous year, the first three hours of that game was like a nonstop, like, final battle center flag match because oh, yeah. we were just beating on each other. And I think it caught a lot of the players that showed up for that one off guard not knowing that. I don't think it will have the same impact on the players. I think they'll know what they're walking into this time coming in the second year. Yeah. Um, a lot of people burnt out real fast last year. Well, see, I made I made a the joke. Of paint in the year. I made a joke before we got there. I was like, because somebody told me how big it was before we got there, like thirteen acres or something like that. I was like, jokingly, I said that means as soon as we step on the field, we're gonna be shooting each other. I laughed it all because I was like, yeah, I was, I'm just I'm exaggerating stuff. But then we got to the field, and like as soon as you stepped on the field, you were shooting each other. Oh yeah, it was from one entry gate to being within range of the opposing entry gate was. 15 to 20 feet less if you were shooting first strikes. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm a fan of first strikes. I use them myself, although not in large quantities, but yeah. uh, I like their involvement in paintball because I, I think it adds an extra layer to the game. It's more dynamic. But that's one field where I looked at it and said, you don't really need these here. No. Just because it's so close at all times. And it was pretty much wide open. Like There wasn't a lot of trees to block your Block your shots either. Between the two command posts, no, there weren't. Yeah. Now, once you got past those and tried to get into the mission area, um, it was a little, it was a little more cover out in that area. It was a little denser. Um, I think it will be better for the June game because a lot more of the foliage will have grown by then. Yeah. Whereas the previous year was what? Uh, it April, was in March. April, I think. Yeah, it was April. April it was April. Yeah. The, the ground cover was still not fully bloomed at that point. Yeah. So, it was it was quite uh quite muddy with the swamp area, but they said they got rid of that. So yeah, I hear they've uh, they've they've moved a whole bunch of dirt in, filled in the swamp area, made it less of a yeah. less of a swamp. Uh, but I'm used to Dreaded Legends being a swamp. I mean, the first three years it was held literally in a swamp. There were alligators on the field. Yep. Like, uh, uh, I like the tracks and trails. Don't get me wrong. Although there were some policies down there that I wasn't thrilled about. Oh yeah. They had they had some alcohol policies that, uh, well, as a pirate, I had uh, issue with. 
Uh, see, see, we uh, we camped out there, and like I say, I have nothing but gr- great things to say about the field. We, we were there the last year, yeah. and nothing but great That's things great to say about the great. field. The field was great. You know, we camped. You know, we came in, said, "Hey, this is how big our camp is." You know, because they were charging for like uh, it was like thirty bucks for campsite or something for, per per tent that would fit a certain amount of people. Yeah, and we told them, "Hey, you know, we got a different kind of setup. You know, we got these campy tents that we put on side campies, but." We're technically only going to take up enough space as a as one tent. Like, okay, yeah, we'll pay for one site. And you know, thirty bucks is kind of a lot to pay for a tent site when yeah. you, you have no water hookup, no power hookup. You had to position your tents away from either cow pies or ant hills. And then yeah. the rest of the field that you're camping in, there was only like two or three more campsites out there. So it wasn't like you were paying for to, for because it was in high demand. So so whatever we we we're, we're like whatever you know we'll we'll pay thirty bucks just cause we don't want to go to the hotels we want to spend we want to spend night in the field you know this is this is how we camp so we'll pay that thirty bucks and then late at night like midnight or so or a little later their security guy came around trying to hassle us and trying to get us to pay more money and he was like oh no you guys got to pay for three more campsites that's like ninety more dollars you got to pay it right now and you know yeah he he I, went. I heard of several complaints along those lines. He he waited until late at night when people had already been drinking and partying to where you're not functioning correctly to come out and try to hassle you. Yeah, and, and when it, at that point it would not make sense to try and break your camp down and move to a hotel site if you disagreed with that. And we had people. Yeah, like, that's that's. We he was he was telling us he was going to kick us out that night, and I was like, so you're going to kick out drunk people, make them drive down the road. I'm like that doesn't make sense. Like, what what what, what do you want us to do here? And, yeah, and then on top of that, like, they can be culpable for the fact that y'all were drunk because they had a bar on site. Yep. And the thing was, like, he finally backed off and said, "Okay, you know, well, first thing in the morning, I'm coming out here at six o'clock in the morning, and I'm kicking you guys off off, off the field. Like, you guys can't you guys can't camp here anymore, and you guys won't be able to, won't be able to play either." And like, okay, well, he never. He never came. We talked to DJ, and DJ was at City Hamlin, so the guy never came back and bought us all weekend. But yeah, it, DJ probably did actually handle that yeah. situation. But it was we had, we had a similar complaint happen to the uh, the MVP compound, and based on the way it had been set up, and we had we had paid, and yeah. we had a very similar setup. I think to you, where you're using the the clip in tents that attach to the the ten by ten canopies, yeah. and we had discussed with them based on where we were at that the canopy was the uh, was the tent and the, the clip-ins were attachments to same said tent. Yeah. I think the same guy came by through and wanted to talk to us about that. Now, I went in camp when that happened, but um, needless to say, they didn't get any more money out of us either. No, like, I, I was uh, I was re- trying to recover from a blackout, so he really got belligerent being on that one. If, if, I'd have been, if I'd have been like a few more drinks less than I had, we would have had a little bit of an argument there because uh, it was just like I say he he was he was basically being a predator at that point because he waited until the point when everybody can't leave to come out there and try to extort money, and yeah. that's that's why I'm glad that that game got moved to a different field because it would have probably kept me from going back to Dread Legends just just because that one incident with one jackass. Yeah, well, there were there were other issues that also led to it. One because it was so far away from a central population of paintball players, it was one of those things where they knew they couldn't really grow it any bigger than it had gotten yeah. at that location. Also, Tracks and Trails was not really... They got a paintball field, but what their original intention when they set that place up was was as like like a festival thing. Yeah. And that's why they had their policies in place involving campgrounds and all of that. And they just wanted to continue running that. And a big music festival, I understand why you do camping rules and camping fees the way they have set up. Yeah. But that's a very different animal from a paintball scenario. Oh yeah. Like, so like I say, you know, thirty bucks is a lot, but if you got like say there's you know, a camp a campsite set up like that's not in a cow cow pasture and like yeah. you have power or you have you have some kind of amenity besides one porter john for everybody that's in the field. That's yeah. that's that's something you know you pay thirty bucks, but Here's here's just a here's a field here. That's all that's all it is. Here's a field. Give us money. That that was that was a little much yep. for me. And then like by the way, you might get you might get eaten by a gator in the middle of the night too. So 
Like that was, that was that was always good. But now now the lagoon they have there with the with the tiki tiki hut, I like that. Oh yeah, that was a cool structure. I I love that. I like that they had that option there. But then again, that same option presented another challenge because they had licensed alcohol sales on property. That was why they kept telling everyone that they could not have their own alcohol in their campsites. Wow. Yeah. And that has to do with licensing laws. And yeah. I understood why they were doing it, but I would rather go to a paintball field that wasn't selling its own alcohol and bring my own alcohol into my camp room. Yeah, I mean... That's my personal preference because, one, I like to drink what I like to drink. Yep. All right, I just do. And uh, two... I'm not someone who wants to drop seven bucks for a cocktail. No, especially yes. not, especially not when you've already paid registration and paint, and you, and you're using all your equipment right. and everything. So yeah, no, it's it's just it's a little weird, weird to me. I don't know. Like I say, it was it was definitely one of the best trips I had though. Oh yeah, it was a fun trip, and for me, it was a big thing because I was I wasn't just down there to. Uh, just to play paintball, I was down there with MVP, and we had stuff that we were doing all over the uh, all over the area outside of the game itself. So yeah, yeah, you guys, you guys do a little more in paintball. We we were, we were just there to party. Like we played yeah. we played some paintball, we partied. But it was it, 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 it like say you know, I would I would go back if if there was an event there, but it would have to guarantee that we would not get hassled in the middle of the night. That that's yeah. that's my thing. And I, I don't, not reasonable. That's an incredibly reasonable take I, on it. I don't think they could guarantee that either, unless they just get away with certain people. But well, it's it's kind of immaterial because tracks and trails closed down. They're, oh, they're they no did? longer business. Wow, I didn't, I didn't close down. Close down. I thought I thought it was still in yeah, business. Yeah, for... that was back. Uh, that was before the new year. They shut down officially. Wow. Um, I don't know all of the wherewithal that led to that, but I think it was a case of uh, they built it, but they didn't come. They, they made that big facility to do certain kinds of business, but they never had a music festival held there, as far as I know of. Um, they had the, the trails for the off-road races, but I think they had a lot of people use it as a practice field, but I don't recall them ever hosting a main event. Yeah. Well, I, th I think the Punta Gorda is a big retirement community, too, so not a, there's not a lot of retired folk out there riding, riding motocross. Yeah, and so. it was... It just never really became what I think they thought it was going to be. Yeah. And it was losing money. And that, this is just, this is my guess. I don't have any inside info on it. So. Yeah. Like, is it, it's, we, this is the second field I've been to in Florida. Like, don't, we went to Gator Extreme out, outside of uh, Tampa. That's, any chance I get to go to Florida, I go because Florida's fun. Oh, yeah. That was, like I said, that was part of the reason why, despite some of the discrepancies with the event, I had a good time down there because, well, hell, I was in Florida. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, no. it's on my short list of places I would move to if I left Alabama. Yeah, there's, there's no rules in Florida. You just do what you want to. Yeah, it's like you're drinking White Claw. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, let's see. Uh, what else? Is like, I think uh, there's a game here, ho hopefully. They're, they're allowing our fields up here to, to stay open as long as you follow social distance guidelines. So, yeah. I saw that it was a, a news article that uh, what was it Black Ops Burton Beach was in. Yeah, both both I think uh, I'm not sure about the other, both of them, but like, I know uh, the Paintball Central's up here, Rock Hill and Greensboro. They're letting you come out, and so is Boston okay. and uh, Locust. So it's just they, they got they got some kind of letter in the mail or something saying you know yep. as long as you follow the guidelines you you can play. But I don't know if you can follow the six foot guidelines at an actual scenario event. No, uh, the. For recreational play, I think you can pull it off to some degree, but I got mixed feelings on how I think fields should handle that. I don't want to tell them don't do it because I know a lot of these places really do operate on that thin line of financial solvency. Yeah. Um, I don't want them to not. I don't want them to fold and collapse. That's the last thing I want. But I also look at it and say, can you really maintain that level of of sanitation yeah. at a ball field. Like, now, I'm going to give Black Ops credence because having been to their facilities, they're not an average paintball field. Yeah. Uh, you know, Black Ops, North Carolina, the the one that we were just at for Bones and Ashes, yeah. you, know, you go in there, they have options and 
facilities that a lot of paintball fields just don't have. Oh, yeah. Like, so, they have a nice little, uh, what the hell are you going to call it? Like, they have a nice little shop in there where you can buy a whole bunch of stuff. It's air conditioned. They have yeah, nice I mean, bathrooms. I mean, retail facility is is more like an actual storefront than anything I found on most paintball fields. Oh, yeah. uh, but the fact that they actually have like proper bathrooms and not just like, you know, like or, they built it onto the side of a building, but like it was structurally planned. Yeah. You know, yeah. And they've got the ability to do quality sanitation of the equipment they have. So yeah. Yeah, I feel like they're the exception to the rule, though, not the standard. Oh, yeah, they're, they're exception. Most places are not that, not that well equipped, no. It's, you got Porter Johns in most places. And yeah. To get, like, the Porter John clean once a day is a hard is a hard job, apparently. Oh, yeah. Like, I know a lot of fields that I travel to where you know that the Porter John that they have is on, like, at best an every two-week pumping cycle. Oh, yeah. That's and you show up and you know it hasn't been clean. Whereas, yeah. like, you go to other events. Like, this is one thing that I I have always enjoyed about the CPX events I've gone to is that I wake up the next morning and they have had someone come through and, you know, and reset all of the port johns, like, at 5 a.m. Oh, yeah. So. I usually just use the woods. Like, I, I don't like port johns at all, so I, I go out in the woods. And if I if I had to like do anything like I'll go, I'll go to Planet Fitness and take a shower, so yeah. that, that's how that's how I run stuff. But like I kind of I kind of glamp, I guess. I'm gonna say glamp. Yeah, no, I, I I've gotten to where I uh, you know when I first got into paintball, the idea of spending money on a hotel was just expensive to oh, yeah. or to camp out in it. But I I've, I've changed my tune a lot over the years. I I, I do not uh, don't stick my nose up at the idea of a hot shower. I think I think I'm coming around to that side now too because uh. Yeah, it's I, I like being able to you know drink and then go to bed and not have to like worry about driving anywhere. But I'm also getting a little older now, so yeah, I might start I might start going to hotels one day. But see, the key this is the key as you become an older paintballer, you get a hotel room and you get a young teammate that's going to be responsible for driving your junk. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure they're under twenty one, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's that's why we got to grow the sport. We got to grow our DD. <laughs> well, like, I know Folder Gap. Like, you pretty much have to camp right now to like have a spot. And, like, I uh, yeah. If there is one thing that I'd say that they really, if they can find a solution to it, one problem that Folder Gap has is that it is outgrowing its campgrounds. Oh yeah. Like I don't remember being this bad a couple years ago. Like it, it was it was bad a couple years ago. Where like. If you got there early, you might find a spot. But now it's like you get there three hours early, and you're still not gonna find a spot. Yeah. Now, if you, if you don't set up camp on Thursday, uh, you've got to walk. And if yep. you don't set up your camp by noon on Friday, you don't camp. Yep. And like, um, one of the things that I think is contributing to that is that we have a lot of people that will show up and set up a camp that's big enough for all of their team to stage out of. But most of their team is hoteling it and then driving in to use that camp. Yep. And see, and see, like that's, that's another thing they wouldn't let you. They wouldn't let you do that a couple of years ago. Like, uh, people were coming out roping off areas and then yeah. going, then going yeah, to. Yeah, I was I was there for one year for that. Uh, what was the team? I want to say it was uh, one of the SAS chapters. I don't know which one it was, but they had roped off an enormous section. Yeah. And gotten away with it, and then when you walked through there. They had a fair amount of waste space in their camp that just wasn't being used. Oh yeah, like, like I know, like a couple of years ago, they were if you like roped it off, and they were the the field 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 crew was coming out and cutting, cutting your ropes down. Yeah, because your stuff wasn't there, you weren't there. Like it's and like you would sit there and you'd have your camp set up, and then somebody would come up and ro- like throw a campy down and expect that oh that's that's my spot. Well no like. If you're not here and our buddy comes in, we're going to move your stuff for you. Yeah. He's going to be here. You're not going to be here. So <laughs> yeah, it, they, they needed to – if they were going to have some areas that were like for 10 by 10, like staging points that weren't actually campgrounds, yeah. that needed to be marked as something separate so that actual campgrounds were available. Yeah, that's that's, that's one thing they need to do because like, I know they separate their RVs. You know, people park RVs a different different part of the field. Yeah. They need to separate everything. Like you know, if you're if you're staying overnight, you can camp over here 
or over here for NATO or here, over here for Warsaw. Yeah. But everybody else is just staging. Here's your little spot. Really, what they need is they just need more land. That um, would be good, too. I don't know how you make land appear. I don't know what's going on with the properties on either side of them. Um, there was talk, I think, about them having, like, a separate area for parking and shuttling people. I don't know how used that got. It got used quite a bit. That central column of parking space that's uh, right behind where the airfield station was, was fourfold the gap turned into additional camping. I think that would make up a lot of the problem. Yeah. And then you just have to have the cars parked elsewhere and that shuttle running. Yeah, and you got you got teams that have been there for years, and they show up, this is my spot, you know, I'm not going to move from my spot. Well, well, no, you have to move from your spot because other people are coming in too. Yeah. And, and back in the day, people used to make these big camps. Like, I know uh, the CEF, they, they have a huge camp. And yeah. it's not all utilized. So it has there, to- was the, there was an instance that I ran into in this very last year. Like, I was showed where the, the Warsaw General Camping Area was. Like, yeah. this is where the general sets up his camp. And I look at it, and it's enough space for four Class A bus-style RVs that's just for me to use. And wow. I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't need – I'm sleeping in the back of my Acura. I, I don't need all this space. So yeah. I told my units – to set up pavilions right there for staging ground. Yeah. Like, you know, just come set up your area right here to get prepared, which technically, according to the way they map it out, we weren't supposed to have. But what else was I going to do with all that space? That just seemed... Wasteful. Yeah, it seemed wasteful for me. Yeah. Now, I have I have been there years where I pulled up, and there were some of those big RVs there, like, uh, I want to say the 2017 and 2018 years. When I was uh, with the uh, Spats, there were a couple of big RVs set up there. Yeah. So. I know paintball soldiers, they have a lot of people come out. Like, they have a lot of people in the unit. Like, Jason likes the whole unit to camp together. Yeah. And, and they've got one of the one of the non-mobile buses that's yep. been converted to a, a cabin, if you yep. will, is set up where they set up at. And, like, I know I camped with them, like, last year and year before and all, and – it's so packed deep in there. You're like trying to walk by tents without phone on them. So yeah, I saw their compound. They actually they set up a really slick compound. Like oh, they yeah. had the cabin bus itself, and then they had this circular array of tents with only one way in, so they knew all their stuff was pretty much secure. Yeah, and that's another thing about camping is when you're all spread out, there's no security. No, your stuff can grow legs real quick. Yeah, like, we, we've we've camped there before. We we've had it like. We've had the place camp like closed off with the tarps and everything, and you yeah. still you still get people that, like they'll raise tarp and looking at, looking into what you're doing like oh, nah you, you don't belong here you can keep you can keep walking yeah like, it's yeah just, camp campsite security is one of those things that yeah, teams have to develop a system for because otherwise uh, you lose things oh yeah like we we made we always made it where like uh there was one entrance one exit and you had to go through the whole camp to get to it. So yep. it, it it made it a little better for us, but it, it's a it's a photos photos good time. But like I said, there's there's a couple couple things that can make it better. And yeah, I mean, the, once again, that's every event. Every oh yeah. event has places where they can uh, where they can grow, where they can improve. Oh yeah, but like I say, you know, you're going up against uh, some people this year that probably won't get a lot of a lot of players to back them up. But hey, whatever. You know, there is there is truth in that. Um, I question what sort of a what sort of recruiting they're going to get based on the response they got. But on the other side of the same coin, um, I think that bringing in new blood, just like you were saying earlier, is is a good thing to do for the event. Yeah. Well, and they are new blood. Now they're controversial. Um, they have definitely rubbed some people the wrong way. Oh yeah. You don't have a problem with the first one. I I like the command bros. Um, but I know that this is a very different event from what they what they do normally. Yeah, I, I know um, they're big big players for the uh, Mission Master series of games yeah. and big proponents of that style. And Folda does not play like a Mission Master's no. game, and they don't have a big following here. Like they got right. a big following other other places, so here is not they're not really they don't have a big following. A lot of people don't like them, so it's gonna be hard for them to get. It's gonna be hard for them to actually recruit from the area. So they're going to bring people in from out of state and hope, hopefully those teams can bring in a lot of players. Yeah. 
But well, they are they're coming in off of a uh, off of a win from a super game, and I hear they're going back to that one this year if that ends up being held. I don't know exactly yeah. whether or not that event's been affected yet. I haven't heard anything yet. Yeah, I, I haven't heard anything one way or the other about that event, how it's going to go. So I think a lot of how they do in that event will have an impact on how well they manage to recruit for this yeah. one. I took a very different stance when I came into the 2020 FOLDA. I made it a point to focus specifically on this game, and I turned down other command opportunities yep. uh, for the season just that's to make sure that I could stay on top of this event. That's pretty much what um, you had to do. Well, it is and it isn't. If this were a game where I knew I was coming in as a complete outsider, um, I would know that I would need to travel around to meet, greet, handshake, and try and get people to come. Yeah. The fact that I'm coming in as a returning meant that it's very different. Now I have to show people that I've already led once before that this isn't a fluke. This is this is how business is done. Yeah. Um, they're doing it from the same way I would have had to have done it the previous year, which yeah. is go find people. See, like, I don't know, like, Folder Gap's had some, uh, had some generals before that, like, don't like to communicate with their, everybody, you know. Yeah. My first Folder, I was still young, and I was still making, like, a lot of noise. Like, I'd call people out for stuff on, on stuff. Like, well, their general that year, I was part of the Warsaw page and never heard that general, or never saw that general make a single post. Yeah. So I made I made a question. I was like, "Hey, uh, what's going on here? You know, you haven't seen a single post from this general. Like, do we have a game plan? What, what's going on?" And yeah. I made um, people. I paid. I made. I made people mad by asking that question. And like, okay, you know, I'm 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 paying for the game too. You know, I'd like to like know that somebody's actually trying. And we got our asses handed to us that year. Like, I think it's the only year like recently that that uh, Warsaw got beat. But was that the that wasn't the 2017 year, was it? I don't know what year it was. It was – I can't remember her name. She, I can't remember who, who the general was. But it was – it was I think it was, a, it, was, it was a first year playing, so it was probably five years ago. So 2015 okay. probably. So, no, that, that yeah. wasn't the game I'm thinking no. of. There was one where at the very last second there was some uh, – there was a big shakeup in the command structure. The general got changed over. Yeah, that was 2017. Yeah, that was 2017, and I was I was in on the command structure. That that was actually how I got into the command structure of Warsaw, because I think if it had been one of the traditional generals, they they probably would not have reached out for me. But uh, I got tapped to do that, and then the command structure kind of went silent yeah. for a while, and there was there was some real life issues that was going on with oh, yeah. uh, with Maureen Armstrong, oh, yeah. who was general that year. So I don't falter at all, like. Yeah, I'll look. I don't. I don't look at it just when it comes down to it. Like the real world does have to come first. Oh yeah, well, see, um, see, it was, it was, it was, it was a, a real, it was a scramble to try and figure out what we were doing with a brand new game plan. And the fact that we pulled out a tie that year, I was very pleased just with that, considering where we started. Yeah, well, see, it was a week out before we even had any real communication. See, like a lot of people aren't very happy with the tie, by the way. Oh, like, I, I, like, uh, that, both that, sides were upset. There was referee call situations. Yep. And and I know all about that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I could look at it from a command point of view and say, I knew where we were when we walked on the field to start Saturday. And the fact that we didn't get our ass handed to us, I was happy. Oh, yeah. Well, like, like um, I said, the, the, one, the one I was referencing, that wasn't Maureen. That was the one before her, uh, two years before okay. that. Like I say, like I say, I understand that like that like things can come up and you know paintball isn't number one in this in the whole thing, but like when you have seven hundred people that are depending on you for a game plan because you, they want to come out and play and spend their money, and yeah. you can, and you can't take five minutes out of a year to make one post, it kind of yeah. it kind of rubbed me raw a little bit. Like like it was just you know make a post and like the only time that they started posting was when people called her out like. Well, after the game, you know, some people got upset. And, you, know, you they won't, they won't let uh on the Warsaw chat, and we're like, this is bullshit. You know, it's because of this and this and this. And amazingly, life would just life would just open back up, and they they could respond. And like, yeah, they responded. Well, they responded. People like, are real quick to defend themselves when they're being called oh, out. Yeah. They're not always so quick to open themselves up beforehand yeah. to being called out. And, see, and, and it's 
you can't have said the wrong thing if you don't say anything yeah. at all, right? Oh, yeah. Which is a poor direction to take it in, but... And see, here, here's the thing, like, bring, bring up a whole subject. That's that's one that's one thing I hear from a lot of players that they have a problem with the command staff. You know, they, uh, you know the command staff, you know, general, he talks to, he or she talks to the unit commanders, unit commanders talk to their people, blah, 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 blah. Well, there's a lot of players out there that go on the field not knowing what they're doing. Yeah. Like, uh, that's, scenario games just to be honest and that's because a lot of people that play them don't make any effort to be involved in well, command structure a lot of people i've heard from they're like they was they would say the, like they would go and ask like a unit commander hey what are we doing and they're like we'll tell you later or you know yeah well now that's that is problematic yeah and, 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 like, and then i try to hammer into the people that are working for me that we are as much as we are you know unit commanders and generals trying to win a game, we're entertainers. Oh, yeah. Like, People are paying their money to have a good weekend. Yeah, and like, part of that is engaging with these players. That's what we've been asked to do. Oh, yeah. And see, um, like, you've got you've got guys like, they're like, well, if a general would have asked us to do something, we would have done it. But no, or if a general or a unit commander would have said, hey, go get this, we would have done it. But, like, we're out on the field and nobody's telling us what to do and we're just going towards a fight. That's all we're doing. Right. And a lot of that also has to do with having some sort of a communication structure. Yeah. Like, it's a it's a delicate balance how much communication you want to have coming into you in your command tent. Yeah. Um, I made it a point where I was locked into reaching to my unit commanders and their XOs and a couple of other key people. And that was all the communication traffic I had coming into my tent because anything more than that would have just been overwhelming. Oh, yeah. But each of those units is supposed to have some sort of communication network to the teams within their unit. Supposed and that's to. that's how you kind of get that information out there. Supposed to. But like, on top of that, you have to have that presence on the com on the actual battlefield to engage with the players that are there. Yeah. Some people are really good at that. Some people, not so much. Well, some see, people get locked into the idea that they're there to actually hammer the hammer on the trigger and do the fighting. Yeah. And you need those people. They're not necessarily the best leaders. Yeah. Well, see, like last year, I was I was pretty much bond with the Voodoo Kings a lot, and you know they go they go there. There's they got ex pros. They got current guys that are like D two on on the field. You yeah. know they got they got really good players, and they'll go out and do work, but. You know, Reaper, Reaper made a point of calling them out at uh, on one on the last show he was on, saying you know it was noticed that they were out there, they were out there hammering hammering the the opponents every time, but yeah. but they didn't do any missions. Well, well Matt, Matt Sausman he he listened to it and he said, yeah, but nobody told us to do any missions. Like we we asked you know we asked you know hey hey is there anything you want to do and all people would do is say go for it. Okay, well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a fill-in from, like, the behind-the-scenes on that one. It comes to Fold the Gap and missions. Okay. There were only three missions for the entire event for the, the, the Warsaw side, and they were all specific to being done with the Special Forces. Okay. Um, and from what I understand, every year, you only get a handful of missions. It's basically a you know, whole field position style game. Yeah. And the instructions that I was giving out is, well, this is what flag is we need people hammering on. So send people to hammer on this flag um, and prioritize flag A over flag B this particular hour because yeah. the points shift around. And see, um, I've got a, a, a spreadsheet that spells out how it's it's calculated, and i I got no problem showing it to you. I don't well, think it needs to be hidden no. information. Um, no, it's not, it's but, not that. Like, like I say, it's not like – People don't need to know everything, every little, every little detail, but it's like, you know, you go out to the field and like I say, if you're not in the know about what's going on, you're just going out to the field like, you know, you're starting where you're supposed to start and you might know where you're supposed to go first thing because it tells you to on a, on a web page, but like, the, but not, I, not, not everybody uses it. Yeah. No, I fully understand. But then you got, then you got teams that are coming out to like, oh, there's a unit commander here. Let's ask him what he wants us to do. And instead of saying, hey, we got to, like, attack this base or we got to defend this part of the area, you know, this, this is what's going on, this is what's going on, he's basically going, um, go shoot those people over there or, or 
stand by or we'll do something here or go talk to that guy. And it's just, it's a lack of communication on the field for most of us. Like, you can run into three or four different unit commanders just walking from, from Bravo to the tree line sim and you hear four different, four different versions of what they want you to do, but they don't, they don't tell you what to do. They just say, Oh, go, go over there, go over there, go over there. Yeah. It's, it is so. I, I get that. And honestly, for everything I've been led to understand, that's probably about the most realistic aspect of this simulation. Um, people don't always know what's going on. Well, and I, unit commanders, I love the group that I had, but if they weren't a focus at that point, I wasn't dumping more information than I thought they could yeah. use on them. So, like, when it got to – also, it got to a point where we had pushed the line so far ahead of where projections would say. At one point, I got told, you know, just tell your players to have fun because yeah. the game's already won. Oh, yeah. So it was midday Sunday when I got given the instructions that there was – it was mathematically impossible – for NATO to win at that point, I yeah. stopped giving orders at that point because at that point I just wanted the players to go, you know, go shoot their paint, have fun, or heck, come off the field, go go grab a cold one at this point if you want. Yeah, uh, and it's funny, and I said that over the radio, and all of a sudden the Warsaw players were fighting even harder. We backed them all the way into their start game. Oh yeah, like, which, that's not something that happens in Fulda. No, they like, found out they'd already won, and it just made them fight even harder. Like, I, I don't understand that. At and all. usually when you That's tell somebody, psychology. usually when you tell somebody to have fun, they they actually go out and like they stop worrying about getting shot or anything. Because because I coached a I coached a a, a D five uh, CFOA team last year, and okay. they were getting they were getting stomped. You know, they lost they lost the first four points, and I was like, you know, guys, I was like, look, you're not making the playoffs, the playoff bracket. Just go out and have fun, and they won three straight. Like to end, to end the day, I'm like, it's just. And telling people to have fun, like it changes your mentality a little bit. But, but what I'm saying is, like, well, I'm going back, going back to my point because I'm a hound in because I'm a hound in here because I've heard people say they're not coming back to Folder Gap because of this reason. Like, like the camping thing, people will people will glance over the camping thing and just say, you know, that's part of the game, you know. But when you go on the field and a team goes up to a, to a unit commander and asks them what to do, and they pretty much get dismissed. Because it it makes it makes the team feel like what they're doing on the field isn't important. Like don't, you're only focusing yeah. on the certain people that are in command. Like like if 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 this guy if this team right here knows what's going on because they're in the command they're in the command section and they're in the command chat, but you don't know what's going on. Does that mean their more their more their money is worth more than yours? And that's what it makes people feel like. Because especially when they go out and ask somebody, what do you want to do? And you pretty much get blown off because you're not part of that group. That right. And I, I I want players to know that I hear that. And I want to make sure that everybody is as involved in the process as I can make them. Mm -hmm. And my line is open. Like I've got I've got, you know, my messenger sitting right here. I've got my phone here, you know. Anybody that has any questions leading up, I encourage them to reach out to me because I want everybody involved. And during the game itself you know, I'm there in my command tent, and I am, you know, I'm handling, juggling and handling radios, but I will make time for any and every player who wants to ask me, well, how can I help? So that's that's awesome. That, that's that's what people are going to That's what people are going to want to hear. Like, they want to hear that they can come and talk to you. Because before, before you know, a few years ago, you know, the command tent was one of those places where it was almost like a taboo to try to go in and ask somebody, Hey, can I come in here and talk to somebody? It's yeah. all it's always been like, well, what 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 the fuck are you doing here? You know, you're, you're not you're not worth you're not worth anything to come in here. So it's it's driven that that fact has driven quite a few people away from coming back to folding out. And I know I know like a few people not showing up to a to a twelve hundred player game doesn't sound like a lot, but it does. It's, yeah, it's it, not good. I don't yeah. want to hear of people saying I don't want to go. Yeah, it, it's just, I'm fine when someone says I can't go. Here's life reason. Yeah. Or I got a different game I'm going to, and that's my focus. But when someone just says I don't want to do that, well, then there's got to be a reason, and we need to address that. Yep. And, and if it's reasonable, we fix that. Oh yeah. Like like I say, you know, a lot like uh, there's a lot of people that go out there, and like it, it could be their fault too, because because they don't ask, you know, or they don't read the, they don't read the in the website. Yeah, saying what's there's, wrong. There's a lot of that. And they're like, well, I didn't know what I was doing. Well, did you try to ask somebody? Well, no. But 
those people, I understand, you know, if they don't know what's going on, that's on them. But, yeah, we, but we're not talking about those people. Yeah, but there's been other... Because we both understand. There, yeah. there, are, there are some people out there that, uh, you know, they're cows you can't lead to water. Yes. But like, the cows you can lead to water, we want to let them know why they need to drink. Yes. And like, like I say, like I say my, my thing is, if a team does come up to a commander and says, hey, you know, because usually the commanders are there, he's, he, him or her, they're kind of standing in the back of the watching, helping their team, helping their team do what they're doing. You can take two seconds to say, "Hey, I appreciate you guys, you know, coming up. This is what we're doing. This is where I need you." You yeah. know that that right there would change the aspect of people feeling like they're unrecognized. You know, you know, at the end of the day, there's only going to be a few people that get recognized up on the podium for doing a good yeah. job. And, and you know, sometimes there is there's a there is an issue with that, and. I will be the first one to hold my hand up and say, I may have made a poor choice in the previous year because I had some people that were in my ear constantly about what they should be doing, and that was impressive to me. Yeah. And then I found out later that they were a much smaller force on the field than I had been led to believe. You'll, you'll get that in every game. There's always going to be that one person that's going to kiss your ass the whole game. Because they want you to know their name over and over again, like, like it reminds me of the office when, like, when Dwight was trying to be the manager and he kept like referring to himself to White Manager, whatever. Yeah, it was. It's you got those guys on the field, and honestly, when you're commanding that many people, that's gonna get that's gonna be sitting in your, sitting in your head. Yeah, so so stuff like that, you know, I understand. You know, sometimes you know mistakes can be made, but my thing is, you're not not everybody's gonna get recognized for the effort they put in because there's only so many awards out there. There's only so many minutes on the stage you can talk. Yeah. But there, there's always going to be unsung heroes. But, and, but when a team comes up to a commander and says, what do you want me to do? And you get the blow off. It's kind of like a slap in the face. Yeah. No, that's, that shouldn't happen. It, um, I've personally seen it happen over the last, I've been doing this five years. I've seen it happen multiple times over the last five years where you, you just, you know, you're with a group, and you may you may not even be with your team, but you're with a group of people, and, yeah. you, and you see that one guy with the radio, and he's talking on the radio, he's calling stuff into commands. So you're like, this guy's a new, new commander. Hey, boss, what do you want us to do? Oh, uh, we got it taken care of. You just, just go over here. Like, well, that doesn't help me out at all. That, that means that means my time and my money is not as valuable as yours or somebody else's. Right. And that's why I, people don't. I show, see your argument completely. That's yeah. why people don't come back. I will, uh, I will go ahead and give you and the audience a guarantee that that is a, a concept that I'm going to make sure I address directly with my unit commander so that they know while they're on field that their purpose is to make sure they are communicating to all of the players on our side, not not just a select few. Well, I, I appreciate that myself because, like I say, I, I have friends that I want to see every year come to this game, and when they tell me they're, they're not coming next year, it kind of bums me out. I'm like, why aren't you coming? This is why. Well, shit, I, that needs to be addressed. So I, I, you know, me personally, I'm gonna go out and do what I do. But there, I want to be with my friends. And when oh, they, yeah. when, mean, they that, when they don't come, this is an entertainment activity. Yeah. You know, and that's that's what people are paying for. They're paying to have a good time. Oh yeah. And that's why you can be on the losing side of an event and drive home having had a blast. Oh yeah. If you had a good time. Oh yeah. And you can also have raffle stomp your opponents and go home with a bad taste in your mouth because the event wasn't fun. Oh, yeah, definitely. I've been there for that. But yeah, I've, I've had a couple that were like that. Like, like, like I say, you know, you know, I, I understand all in all, you know, it's a big-ass game. You know, your name's, your, name's on the, your name's stamped on the game. You want to go ahead and make sure that when people say, what happened, Folder Gap 2020, this guy won. His command staff won. Also, so you got a lot of stuff on your shoulders. But there's also the fact that there's little teams out there that are just getting started. There's teams out there that are playing this game every year, and they're getting burnt out because you know they're not valued. That's 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 my right. thing. Like, uh, well, I see that. I want to say that I, I come at it with a very different approach. Um, I would rather players remember having had a great time playing for me regardless of whether or not we won. I think that leaves a better impression. And I think that shows that my interest is in seeing to it they enjoy the event is more important 
because that's what they're paying for. Oh yeah. Like I, you know, like I was saying, players. Like when I played on the NATO side, I don't know whether or not we won or lost that game. I wasn't part of the command structure at all. I don't remember the score at the end of that event at all. What I remembered was the time I had. Yeah. I never even heard the score. Uh, and I had a great time. That's why I came back. Oh yeah, it's and like, that was. And now you're correct. Off with the command structure that was telling me what to do and where to be and and why I needed to be there. Yeah. Now I did butt heads a couple of times. I will say that uh, I love the Wilsons to death. I would never want to uh, want to avoid a game they're at, but they're intense when they leave. John is very intense. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, Actually, John wasn't the most intense. It was his, his wife, Kathy. She was... She, she's an angel. Yeah. Uh, no, nah, they're, both, they're both pretty intense. Like, they they're love, very intense, but... They love the game. They were doing what you were saying. They were making sure that they were engaging with anyone that walked up. They didn't turn anybody away. Nope. And they were great leaders for that. That's, that's, um, that's why they usually get picked first you know, like, on small teams, on, like, on small games. Like, they, if they're coming out to a game, they usually get picked to lead. I, uh, I reached out to them. I believe that when I spoke to them, and it's it's been several months now, so I don't remember the whole conversation, I think they said they were stepping away from command for this year. Um, though I, I could be wrong. They could find their way into NATO's command structure uh, this year as well. I think he says that pretty much every year. Like, well, you know, he stepped honest, away a little bit. At, at first I said I wasn't coming back, and then I got a lot of pressure from a number of players and, and from the new event producers to, to reprise my role, and I said, well, to hell with it. Yeah. I, I've got to do it. <laughs> oh yeah, you got you got. If, if you win one, you got to come back again. That's just the way oh, it yeah. works. You got to you got to establish a, it was facts, not fluke. Oh yeah. Like I say, like I say, you know, hopefully, hopefully, some of my friends that said they weren't coming to Fulda this year will listen to this podcast and they'll change their mind because you 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 say you're going to address some of the issues that I know about, and that, that's that's. Well, as much as I, as, as a player general, can. I mean, when yeah. it comes to like stuff on the field itself, oh, yeah. how the events run, I've got no control over that. Yeah. But communicating with my command staff that they need to be inclusive to as many of the players as possible. Yeah. Um, starting not just at my command tent, but on the field as well. You know, that's just that's just a minimum basic standard for oh, yeah. good game running. And see that there. And are- I will. Just I'll make sure that that's harped on and not forgotten. And any of these players that uh, that have claimed that Foley Gap was a question mark for them, uh, that have their, their reasons why they suspect they wouldn't attend, feel free to let them know. They can reach out to me personally. You know, I, right. I will sit down and address that with them and let them know I hear this and I will do everything I can to address it. That's awesome. Like the only, the only other issue uh, is something you can't do anything about. It's just damn hills. <laughs> Yeah, I made the suggestion about a ski lift, and, uh, and uh, there was much laughter, uh, followed by a very stern no, and that look. Yeah, going to duck it in hamburger, that's just, it's not, it's no Mountain Doom, but damn, after a long day of fighting, good lord. Like, yeah, actually, I will say, if there is a spot that truly feels comparable to playing Mount Doom at Command Decisions, it is walking from fold up, up to duck it. Oh, yeah. That, that reminds me. Um, I would say walking from Fulda up Hamburger Hill, but it's a shorter walk. Yeah. It's, 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 it gets a little intense out there. Like, Sossman had me walking all through the damn hills. I, I, was, I was cussing him out the whole way. I shot him in the back. Oh, yeah. I shot him in the back at one point, and he shot me in the ear, but whatever. But uh, I, I appreciate you coming on here and addressing this stuff and, like, talking to me. Oh, absolutely. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you get back to your Saturday and everything. Um, All right. Well, I uh, I thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it's been it. a whole lot of fun on my end as well. I'm glad I had a chance to talk to you about it. Right. And I hear you've got a, a good show up and coming with uh, Reaper and Reaper. So yeah. I'm gonna make sure to tune into that. One. Yeah, it's, it's gonna go live about 6 p.m. Eastern. Like we're all gonna get on the webcam somehow. And, like everybody's gonna look ugly to each other. Oh, fun. I think fun. They're gonna, I think um, they're, gonna, they're gonna team up and pick on me. I think. But like I say I, I, it'd be interesting to see the dynamic on that because uh, <laughs> the two Reapers are very different people. <laughs> oh yeah, like it's it's very uh, strange. But they they like each other, so that's good. That's always convenient. That right. helps. All right. All right man, well, well, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. I look forward to uh, talking with you again soon. All right, hey, come back on anytime.
Absolutely. All right, man. Have a good one. All right. Bye. Bye.